And welcome, welcome. I'm Amaryllis Henderson. Uh, if you've ever heard me talk before, you know that I have a cold. And as indicated by my voice and my top bun, we're just getting things done lately. Um, but I'm still uh, honored to be uh, among so many uh, talented watercolorists, designers, illustrators, and just to be sharing from my experience. I hope that it's helpful for you guys. So let's just jump right in. Um, very quick background. I've, I, I went to Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, and I was an illustration major. So off the bat, you know, I have a huge advantage with that. I did walk away from it though, um, because at that time uh, it was a lot of uh, cold calling and mailers and um, I, I did land some gigs, uh, but I worked full time as a graphic designer and I eventually burnt out uh, creatively. I just would come home and didn't feel like lifting a finger uh, painting. I became more and more intimidated by that blank canvas. And at the time, I was working more in acrylic and in cut paper. Uh, I have always had a knack for watercolor. It makes sense to me. But at the time, it wasn't very cool. So I, I, I went with a different direction. And, um, and I came back to it, what I call my creative renaissance. Basically, I was a new mom, and I uh, needed to remember who I was and would spend uh, nap times in our spare bedroom. We were living abroad at the time in China, and just have my Christian devotion times and paint and just did whatever I wanted and had no plans of showing anyone. And I was also uh, reading the artist way which I recommend um, to everyone and it's it's just based on the principles uh, when this woman went through her writer's block uh, she realized that what uh, creativity is is not something you generate it's something that you uh, are a conduit of and just the general idea of keep practicing you know show up all those quotes that you hear uh, kind of along those lines and to make a masterpiece you need to make a million pieces so just get to work and I really resonated with that and felt a lot of freedom because with every piece I felt like it had to be a home run which is how um, working full-time uh, as a designer or you know on staff somewhere how you can feel where um, everything needs to be awesome all the time and that's just not possible. And it also um, makes you get into a creative rut. It leads you to burnout. And it um, doesn't lead to more creativity because to be creative, you need to explore and give yourself the freedom to try out different things. I'm gonna put my phone on mute here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So. That's when I started painting again, and that was in 2010, 2010. Uh, I did not um, pave a way to become an illustrator. It was uh, something that I did uh, little by little and kept reframing my goals, and I'll talk more about that. Um, I've got a long list of questions here. I'm going to try to um, put them together so that they don't sound like snippets, random snippets. If you're just listening to me while you work, that's how I usually watch these interviews, uh, which have been so helpful. Um, a lot of times, you know, you most of what you hear, you've heard before, but it's great to hear different perspectives and... Uh, you know, with her experience and hearing her old school uh, approach and, you know, living in New York and doing those cold calls and getting out those 
portfolios. Uh, and now it's all through email and websites and uh, contact is a wonderful thing and it's almost a luxury that people need to make time for. And so anyway, I found that all really interesting. Um, something that keeps coming up a lot is uh, your portfolio and style. How did I arrive at my style? Um, what advice I can give for someone finding their style. And um, style is something that you bring to the table and you also develop. And so those, those things about you that you think, oh, there's another Amaryllis piece. Yep, that's, that's exactly what I do every time. I kind of wish it were more like so-and-so and more like so-and-so. Um, screw it, that is your style and, and relish in that. But a way to, to grow, I've found, is um, constantly looking at artwork. And um, that alone will not do it. Uh, what's important is to actually look at the piece intently. So when I'm scrolling through Instagram and I find something that I really like, of course I like it, but then I also, I want to really look at what it is that I like. Uh, during that period when I started painting again, I was looking at a lot of um, Janine Slat Kiss's work and uh, Katie Daisy's. These, these were artists that I had seen before, but I had not paid attention to, um, well, not so much Katie Daisy. She was new to me. Um, I started hand lettering and then I was like, whoa, this is already a thing. I'm on the other side of the world and under a rock. Um, which was great and uh and it was it's been fun to see what a huge resurgence of hand lettering there is uh but i noticed how these little uh details that they'd put into their work are what i was reacting to i would react to the color sometimes when i see something that i like i'm really looking at it and i'm thinking you know what what is it that i like about this is it the composition is it the way that they use line, is it the whimsy of it? Is it nostalgic? Because um, what I'm trying to do is A, not um, get starstruck and think, wow, they do such awesome work and I stink. Or, wow, they do such awesome work and I want to copy it. What I want to do is to glean from their work, put it away, and see how it applies to mine. And it's a, it's a great way to keep yourself from copying others, to stay true to your style, and to also not get discouraged. And what I noticed was within these little details, um, Janine would have some very colorful washes uh, to start off with and, and really just relish in that watercolor. And then she'd come in with very small a very small brush, very small details, and it really made that bird or that flower or that dog or whatever it was pop. Um, in such a way that it, it, it captivates uh, the viewer. And, and so I was like, okay, that's, that's great. I, I didn't know that you could just, you know, do that. And it would make such a huge difference. So I started dabbling with trying uh, to apply that into what I do. And I saw that you can do so much with just a simple circle pattern. You can do so much with... Um, an outline or an eye that always has that little highlight in it. And, and so that's what I would recommend with developing a style. You go out there and you expose yourself uh, to what you really love um, and what you admire, what you'd like to um, get to. You learn from it and then you close yourself off. Oftentimes I will follow people on Instagram or Facebook or uh, social media and and then I'll unfollow because I don't want to be them. I don't want to try to take their clients or or be thought of as oh Amaryllis who looks a lot like so and so. I, I think of Gauguin and how he was often compared to someone else um, and then went off to be by himself to find himself in his own right and his own style. Uh, so those would be my tips as to 
how to find your style. Um, when developing a portfolio, uh, you you hear mixed reviews. You hear keep a very succinct style and and keep your your pieces very you know very much in line. Our directors want to be able to predict what kind of work you do. And and then you also hear that you need variety. That you know. If, if this client sees your work and all they see is flowers and you can do uh, portraits, how would they ever know? And uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, because we enjoy making art, but I would say that um, creating a strong portfolio in each right is, is what's important. People um, are overworked and, and we only have so much bandwidth. Uh, you as an artist need to come to the table bringing the creativity that is what you're paid for and and so there will be a ton of artwork that will not get sold that is just a portfolio piece and a lot of times i'll be working on something and think there's no way that this wouldn't sell this is exactly the kind of stuff that i see you know on the store racks and it doesn't uh but I have to believe that those pieces uh, support the ones that are getting sold. Um, I, recently, I I worked on a, a fashion illustrator illustration book, and it was you know one of those books that goes to you know it's, it's for the like a youth age. Each spread has a different artist and and their approach to fashion illustration, and each spread has a different um, theme or or article of clothing or material or whatever it is, you know, evening gown, jean, whatever. And and so I found it funny. For one, I I realized, oh my goodness, when I was a little girl, this is exactly what I wanted to be doing. It's <laughs> painting pretty girls in pretty clothes. And and so that was that was fun. But also it made me think, you know, this is not what I usually do. Uh I've been, I've been doing a lot of greeting cards lately, and um, now I'm trying to do a little more home deck and and doing uh, sets in that. Again, a ton of work trying to cover different bases, uh, and and so I had to get used to this fashion illustration bent again, and it made me look at my portfolio and wonder what is it in my portfolio that made this client think that I could do this because I, I don't have this really well represented. And and it would be one being, um, I am fairly consistent with the way that I approach the way that I paint. I don't know that that's something that I, I've worked on, but just a tendency. And, and I saw that I have little um, hints to, to faces and characters I, I look around myself, I have some portraits, and they're, they're both, mostly like things that are personal to me. Uh, I, I, I don't present myself usually as, as that type of an illustrator, at least not so far. But, but when you're trying to conquer different areas, you have to create a line, a set for each one. And I keep those individual. Uh, to move on to another question as to how I show the work to to buyers. I, I'm very active on Instagram. This is what, like the fifth time I've mentioned Instagram. Uh, but I don't show everything. I might show a snippet. I will show in progress. Um, I've gotten a little more conservative. Uh, but I'm still showing a lot because I'm working a lot. Uh, and and so I'll, I'll do that and then I also have my website where I have a lot of artwork honestly it's pretty outdated I also um, have my work uh, my portfolio on my agency's website and that is password protected um, but when I want to show people my collections if they're interested in licensing I have different collections in, in, let's say I'll create a PDF 
of these layouts. And I, I do, having that graphic design background, I do um, work on that fairly quickly. Um, not as frustrating as it once was one time when I was using InDesign. I'm not very good at web uh, things at all. And so uh, what I do is I'll create a PDF and then rely on these other websites to, uh, to help me distribute these by creating an email newsletter uh, with links to these on a Dropbox or on ISSUU, which is something that I learned actually from this group, I believe, recently that, excuse me, um, you can use uh, that magazine platform to create your own magazine. And basically, uh, it's it just makes your PDF look sexy and, you know, scroll through. And it's nice that you can create a link or even embed it into your website if you prefer. Uh, so as far as um, private or public, I would say public, you need to uh, give people a taste to some degree. Um, at the very least, you know, something that's, three, five hundred pixels wide at least, uh, bigger than a thousand pixels wide, then it's easier to download and, and um, you know, people overseas feel like that's good enough resolution to put on an iPhone cover or whatever, like, as they've done for me. Um, and, and to have maybe one or two pieces, and if you want to see more, to, to lead them to that in some way. Um, I, I, in my Make It Fun, Make It Sell Skillshare class, I recommended Art Licensing Show. I'm personally not on there just because it's, I have my website, I have my agent, I have, I don't think I have my bases covered, but I only have enough time for um, updating so much. And I, I, I do recommend them. There are, there's, there are other options um, for showing your portfolio. Um, I think the key is to not rely on one single source, uh, be it one source of income or one source of traffic. I, I've looked at, you know, something that I found somewhat discouraging is noticing that the people that I look up to have are usually juggling a handful of uh, mediums through which they they do their work that they show their work and you know they might do books they might teach they also consult they whatever and and I for a second there I was like so that that's the goal to keep doing more <laughs> um, there are very few of us who uh, do well enough to just focus on one area of the market um, and, and, and do well with that. But I've come to terms with it in the sense that I, I realized I do like that variety. There's a reason why I don't have a nine to five. There's a reason why I like to explore different things and why I will be doing fashion illustration one week and thank you notes the next week and a Skillshare class. And that is okay with me. A little later, I'll talk about how I manage all that. Um, but with having, you know, uh, what I was talking about was not relying on one thing. We don't rely on one income stream, but we also don't rely on one stream of uh, exposure. So if you are on Etsy, great. If you are on Instagram, great. If you uh, have your website, great. Uh, the combination of those will help. The more, the better, as long as it's good for you. So what I've found is that I will, I, I just, I dabble. I try this out and let's see if that works. You know, I tried a, a YouTube channel. I didn't give it a fair shot, but while I was dabbling with that, I looked into other ways to teach online and I thought about teaching uh, through my own website and I looked at how much that would be to host uh, you know, there are software developers who will take care of, you know, enrollment and getting paid and things like that. I, I looked at Skillshare, obviously. I looked at 
uh, YouTube, obviously, and um, I looked at one other platform, and I I was assessing which gave me the best exposure, the best bang for my buck. Um, obviously, if I did it through my website, I had more to gain. I had more to do. If I did it on YouTube, there is a potential for a lot of exposure. Um, but the crowd is different. They're, they're looking for different things. They're looking for quick tutorials and they're looking for something that is not as committal, whereas the website people are looking for something that is very one-on-one -on -one and interactive. And so I landed at Skillshare, um, but these are different ways that I have um, tried to explore. You know, that's one story of how I explored that. Etsy was another thing that I kind of dabbled with. Uh, I'm now on Society6. It's something that it was one of those back burner things like, you know, if I have time to set that up, I will do that. I fortunately now have a, a friend partner in on it that I've that I've brought into um, those shop fulfillment things. So she'll take my orders and she will um, send the prints out. And I told her, you know, if you want to set up the Society6 deal, go for it. I know there's also a Zazzle and probably another handful of websites that do uh, POD, payment on demand type work. So when it comes to your portfolio, I have actually found that each one of those venue, uh, venues, I guess, has generated interest, has generated leads, uh, and they always, they tend to go back to my website as kind of a landing page, and from there will contact me. So, um, yeah, use, use different, different platforms and double what's good for you. Uh, as far as how to manage all that, I know this sounds really overwhelming and I really am, am happy to, um, help you kind of reel in all these bits and pieces that you hear on Periscope and on here and on different blogs, um, that, you try things out and you work a little bit and, and, and you need to be very real with yourself. I'm a mom of two boys. Uh, they are four and five. So one of them is in school in kindergarten and the other is in preschool. So I had to, I have to be very real about my time and how I use it. And for a good two years, uh, when we first came back from China, I was eager to get my name out there and, I don't know, do this art thing and see where it goes. And I, uh, I was working late, I, I was kind of consumed by all these things that I needed to do, and I finally, um, I was doing uh, craft shows uh, and art shows, uh, the Etsy shop. And uh, it was it was a lot. Um, I was very regimented in how much I blogged. I blogged three times a week, um, no matter what. And I had to stop and take a good look at what I was doing. I created a spreadsheet of which I hate spreadsheets, but this is how much I really needed to just sit down and get real. I created a spreadsheet of all the things that I do and all the, all the different um, revenue streams. And I put in about how many hours each one of those took. So let's say an Etsy order. How many hours does it take from my time, including loading the, the art to uh, shipping it, packaging it, and sending it in the mail. And I would divide that, that many hours by how much I would make per sale to see how much I was making per hour. Uh, it, it was terribly depressing. <laughs> it was, I, I found uh, that I was not doing as well as I thought because you get so excited about every sale um, 
it's hard to be honest with yourself because you don't really want to know. And to an extent, it's good not to know for, you know, at first you are just working your tail off and you're not making much and that that's okay if this is what you really want to do. But I had gotten to the point where I needed to get very practical and, and it helped me decide, you know what, this bottom level of things that are not generating that much income, I need to cut and maybe I can come back to it once the boys are in school or, you know, if something in my situation changes, but right now this is what I need to do. And so I, I took out that lower tier of things and, and I've gotten a lot more productive with my time. I took a course, um, it's just a, a free course of uh, Rachel Cook's uh, Conscious Business Design. And it was just something that I found uh, on Facebook. And, and it, it was very good. It was a, an almost month long boot camp, so to speak, where every day she had a short video and an assignment. And her goal is to help entrepreneurs, particularly female entrepreneurs, to manage their time, to think of themselves as CEOs of their businesses rather than um, the this and the that and the this and the that of their businesses and to create systems to help you be more productive and be more present with your time when you're not uh, working. So this is right up my alley. And a few things that I, I drew from it, um, it wasn't, this isn't necessarily her content because you can go look that up and enjoy that. But after a couple of months of trying to keep this in mind, I created, um, from the homework, was to create an ideal calendar where I blocked off, okay, when do I really have time to work? And I realized that my work times are Monday through Saturday, not including Wednesday mornings. And... I don't count on an afternoon time. It's usually like about an hour uh, that I get of nap time, but I'm going to have to part with that, uh, my youngest nap time at some point. So I have this many hours and then on Saturday I have most of the day because my husband takes the boys and, um, and then Sunday I am with the family and evenings I want to be with the family. And every so often I might have a late night and I, I think that's okay. Uh, as long as there is an end in mind, I wrote a blog post. Um, I'm a contributor to our city's City Mom blog. And uh, yeah, I wrote a blog post about when working for yourself isn't working anymore. And the difference would be striving. And striving is when you're spinning your wheels and you're working so hard and you're not getting anywhere because what's really driving that bicycle is worry and this this desire this dangling carrot that's in front of you and not real goals so it's okay to work hard and work crazy hours sometimes when you see an end in mind when you see a deadline but that deadline once it's met you enter a time of chill relax um i am very busy right now which is why i'm talking to you with a stuffy nose <laughs> Uh, last week we were sick and now I um, I'm trying to catch up and not a hundred percent yet but I'm, I'm again trying to establish those daily times and you know just stick to those and not do late nights because it just it trickles into and I'm, I'm a night owl but I because of my lifestyle I have to create a more rhythmic balance um, when I stay up late at night, then in the morning I'm not pumping out great work and then I'll feel tired and I'll be cranky and it affects my work and my family and it's not really getting me anywhere. Uh, so what I do is um, I'm looking at my calendar and it's a little far from me right now, um, but what the heck, I'll get it. So I have a calendar, it's very makeshift, nothing fancy, but I, I have every month on a small sheet of paper. The reason why I do that is because I don't want 
I don't, yeah, I don't want to fill it up too much. If I look at a calendar and I look at all those boxes, then I am writing in all kinds of things and I'm going to get so much done and I'm not going to do that to myself. Really what I want to do is create goals and just a vision. That's all I need to do to move forward. And what I'll do is um, write the name of the month and then right under it, I put the focus for that month. So this month, since I have half a dozen spinning plates, you know, I will... This month, my focus has been uh, teaching or preparing the class for uh, watercolor florals three ways. And that's that's my focus. So when I have a chunk of time, when I'm wondering, what am I going to do? This is what I need to focus on. Underneath there, I have three or four things that um, I know I can do. They're usually two-hour jobs, four-hour jobs. And... And so when you think about it, that's one week out of my month, which isn't very much, one to two weeks of these smaller commissions or illustration work, things that I'm beefing up my portfolio for. And then on the very bottom, it's all crossed out, <laughs> but it's just to give you a quick visual. On the very bottom, I have what's the one thing that I'm going to do this month that's going to affect the next month? And then the next month looks a lot like this sheet of paper and it says March, which we're now in. So I was looking at my paper and crossing off the things that I've done. Um, March, what is my focus for March? My focus for March is, let's say, wedding invitations because wedding season is in the summer and so, uh, or in the summer to fall and people want to get their invitations out uh, this and next month, even through May for those July, August, September weddings. Uh, and so that's my main focus and then oh yeah I need to do that job for so-and-so oh yeah I need to do this and I'd like to work on this but what is the one thing I'm gonna do this month that's going to affect next month's income and and there are small things it could be meeting with an art director it could be sending my portfolio out I don't try to do a ton within a month and it is because I believe in you know the ripple effect that if you do one small thing regularly these things will accumulate in time and and so most of that list is about this month uh, what is going to generate income for this month or get me forward in my career this month but that bottom one is looking forward um, it's something that I don't expect to make any money off of right away but hopefully I'll see the fruit of that later. So that is how I, I look at my time. Um, I generally tend to do certain things on certain days. Um, I tend to do more wedding things on Saturdays or things that require a chunk of time. Uh, I do videos on Saturdays because my house is empty. Uh, and in the morning, I, I like to do things that I can feel like whew, I checked that off my list. So I tend to do uh, shorter things, like say this interview. Uh, hopefully, will only take me uh, under two hours or something like that. Um, and and that's how how I think of my time. And again, I drop those things. I, I have to take a very hard look as if I were someone else and if necessary I will bring in someone else to look at my my time and tell me this isn't what you need to be focusing on. Um, and if it's something that I love, if it's something that I need to do for myself, am I willing to not count it as work time? Am I willing to put that into my personal time? Uh, or is it just something that I'm hanging on to for some reason that I need to let go of? So uh, I, I'm not telling you to not do what you love uh, if it's not lucrative. I, I don't believe in that at all. I think that what is not lucrative feeds you and it's very important as, as an artist. Um, but to, to consider that, like for instance, I will do Instagram challenges every so often. Um, but I make sure that they don't take me too long. Uh, if it's going to be a sketch a day, if it's going to be, uh, you know, whatever, a, a focus challenge as uh, we're doing 12 months of paint in this group. I love that it's a monthly challenge. 
it's something that, you know, if I have the time, I will throw out a portrait for February and, you know, just for fun, just to be part of the group uh, and be a part of the community. So um, I, I will do that, but I make sure that it doesn't, it isn't taking away from things. And it isn't something that's just feeding my ego because I don't, I don't need to feed my ego. I need to feed my family. So that's a good one. All right. Um, I'm going to switch gears now and go into a quick little screencast and do a quick review of some of the beautiful floral paintings you guys have done. All right. Here we are at the uh, events photo album. I am going to totally pick some at random because it is so hard to choose <laughs> who's to comment on. It has been so much fun to see your work and I, I think these are beautiful. I see them uh, working well in different applications. Uh, so I'm just going to randomly pick one. Let's see who this is. This is Nancy's. Uh, Nancy is a Facebook group follower. I know for sure. I've seen that little picture before. Thank you. Um, this is beautiful. I'm guessing that they are Pascuas uh, poinsettias. And I, I, I like the, the color scheme. What you have here, the red, the green, and the turquoise, those are often a color scheme that I enjoy. I like how the flow is very diagonal. Um, it's I think one of the hardest things to do with florals is arranging them. And that's why floral arrangement is its own thing, of course. And so I, I, I like how you went around, you know, the classical bouquet and did kind of a, a linear pattern. If this extended into even more, I think that would be great if you had, um, this might just be a snippet of something that's much larger, um, but something that could be a background or even um, something that could be used as surface pattern design. I know that gets a little tricky um, with things that you scan and work so freely in, but um, I'm really enjoying it. I like how you used layers of bleeds. That's something that I, I like to remind people of. It's not, you know, watercolor is not something that you sit down and you paint in one go, it's all wet, it's all dry, all at once, and it's gorgeous. Uh, you do work in layers, and you have to keep in mind, you know, where you keep your whites, and, and that these, the, something that I personally find frustrating, but it pushes me, about watercolors, is that they look darker when they're wet, and then they dry lighter, and then I realize, oh no, I'm going to have to put in another layer. So I see in this poinsettia, uh, in the in the petals I see how there is a light wash and then there is a darker one that goes in towards the center and then even darker one in the center I would say break that up a bit I see that you're already doing that with some of those outer petals uh, that some of them are dark and some of them are light and you're not necessarily always doing the same you know light medium dark middle light medium dark middle um, that you do have some variety going and I think that looks great. With the lines, I I like the lines and I would go in and do some of them darker. So you have a variety of line quality. So instead of shadows, you can use a thicker line, let's say on this right hand side, this floral here, uh, where uh, there, I wish you could see my hands pointing at it. <laughs> there are two petals and there's a small leaf coming out of the middle of them uh, pointing at the very center of this piece. That line right there could be a thicker line uh, with say a, a brush or a, a thicker marker than what you're using. And, and I wouldn't outline the whole thing thicker. I'm just saying to come in and use it as a means of uh, creating interest and flow. So maybe that line would be darker and another darker line at the at the lighter yellow flower up in the upper left corner. So you have some push and pull. I'm always um, advocating push and pull and interest because when it comes to uh, commercial work, engaging uh, people is is kind of our our job, and it's 
it's also, you know, it's, it's a challenge and it's, it's what makes it fun to look at. Oh no, I just closed it. I was going to show you very quickly here, uh, these publications I mean, but anyway, I will show you that later. All right. This one is Nancy too. So I'm going to skip that one so that I, I share, uh, some of the fun reviews with everybody, even though these are also different by you. All right, let's talk about this one. I am going to butcher your name. I've heard that said about my name all the time. It's Amaryllis, by the way. Uh, I'm not even going to try. So um, I like what you're doing here. <laughs> this is uh, this is kind of more of a, a graphic take, a, a design-focused uh, way to do your florals. If you're going to do silhouettes and shapes like this, I would suggest then to keep it very tight, very clean. Uh, so that is something that is super challenging with watercolor, of course. You might enjoy using some masking fluid around your black lines uh, so that you get those crisp edges. Uh, someone else in this group had done a similar thing and I, she actually was very messy with her paints and made her lines uh, crisp, but you could tell that it was either going to be, that it, that it was supposed to be that way. So I think you need to waver one way or another, to, to choose one way or another, that you're going to make this kind of a stenciled um, coloring book, something that rivals vector, and, and keep your paintings very clean and very tight, or be very loose. So in that sense, you know, throw in some washes to make, um, to make us sure of which direction you're going in. Uh, I really, again, these are similar colors. Instead of the blue, like Nancy used, you're using yellow, um, uh, and more of a pink instead of a red. I like that. When you scan your work, and I have a quick tutorial on that in, in Skillshare, I would make those whites very bright. And also when you're in Photoshop, you'll be able to select them and change the color. I think that'll help the piece pop a lot when those are bright white. And I like these little vines that you have with these berries that are uh, guiding the eye around, which I also uh, mentioned with um, Maria's piece on, on pebbles. Carmela, I, I know that you do florals quite often. Uh, and and I, I enjoy seeing them. I like this one. This one is, is different, I think, than what you usually post. You tend to post maybe one bold flower or a few, uh, not usually a variety of flowers, so that's fun to see. Um, I, like I said, I like the variety that it's not, it's not very chunky. It's, it doesn't feel like you have, well, how about this here and here, you know, this rose here and this, um, peacock feather here they they have an arrangement I, I think that's very uh, interesting it's difficult with very colorful uh, floral arrangements to ride that line of something that's very colorful and yet doesn't get too um, disunified in its color scheme a way that I do that is I would bring in one color and dab it on several of the brush of the of the flowers here so perhaps um, I'm trying to see a color that you have already brought throughout is the blue. It, the blue, I would add just a touch of yellow to it, make it a little more turquoisey. Of course, that is my opinion. I tend to do that a lot. And to bring that into several of the flowers, maybe the center of um, these roses. Uh, so you're using that color as your dark or the veins of these leaves on the lower left. Uh, you could use that color or the violet I see here at the bottom right and a little bit in your pink flower at, up at the top, that prominent one right there, to disperse that, that purple um, in small touches throughout the floral to make it a little more unified. And I'll tell you my favorite part of this piece is actually the silhouette of these navy blue leaves up towards the top I see uh, two or three, depending on how you count them. Uh, 
I, I, I like how you're juxtaposing that that flat graphic silhouette of florals because or leaves because they're in the back with um, with something more detailed. So if you get discouraged with any of your leaves or flowers here, I would say make them silhouettes because it really makes the more detailed ones uh, stand out so much more. Let me go back to this. I'd love to see the grid here of all of them. Here we go. I'm going to talk about one more. Something, this this is beautiful. Yes, I already talked about yours. These two are, are a bit similar in that they're heavy washes. And I am a huge fan of heavy washes. Because <laughs> I think that's what makes watercolors so fun. Let's talk about Kathy's. Uh, Kathy's so good about posting paintings on this group uh, so I like to see how she has such a variety of work um, with these uh, these ink uh, paintings I, I think you mentioned that you didn't know what you were doing but they look great I like how you use continuous line and it seemed like you hardly ever picked up your brush I um, I'm I'm liking the splatters as well. Um, obviously, when you look at this piece, you're looking at the the top flowers, the five of them. Um, I want to be looking more all around the piece, maybe some leaves or some other circle, berries or something. Um, the wash certainly helps. And maybe you could do that in, in white if you want to keep it monochromatic some white speckles on those buds, the center of those flowers, or some very small white, um, something like polka dots in the background, not something that's rhythmic, but just randomly placed, I think um, would make it feel uh, more, more interesting because what I'm seeing is that I could divide this piece diagonally from upper left to lower right and all the interest is in the upper right which is okay because you do want a focal point but at the same time we want um, we want the viewer to keep looking and so to keep looking let's put a little something else like that little bud that you have on the left hand side here on the bottom um, just a little hint of something to keep us uh, engaged a little longer with your piece and I find it interesting that you used a yellow green, particularly when you'd assume that the yellow green would be on the stems of the flowers, and yet they it is a prominent color in the background. So yay, bravo! I think these are these are wonderful, um, and as you can tell, I like to critique art. Um, I couldn't find the pencil to sign them. I I hardly ever sign my work. So a lot of times if people buy an original, they have to come back to me and say, hey, you didn't sign this. I, I don't know why. So I, I'm going to go ahead and talk about Sharon. Uh, Sharon and I chatted a couple weeks ago. So um, just for fun, I didn't get to talk about her work too much when we were talking. We were talking about just juggling it all, really. So hi, Sharon. And uh, I, I haven't seen too many of your florals. I've seen some on your Etsy page, so this is fun to look at. Um, I I am not very well versed with flowers. This is very embarrassing because I do so many flowers, <laughs> but uh, this this flower is obviously a very complex one, and and you are not one to shy away from from painting things. You will give it a stab and I can tell by your personality that that's how you go about it and I love that. Um, I would bring in more darks. Your your style does tend to be lighter so I, I am hesitant to say that and with that I would just say just a touch. Uh, when you look at a flower it is there are so many folds it's hard to see where the those those darker edges are and you've already found most of them I see on this lower right that crease it looks looks really good very crisp of this petal here um, if you go from the center down just a bit uh, 
you, you see what I'm talking about. And of course, within the center where the folds get thicker, it does get darker. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at those shadows, those, I, I see about three or four petals that are uh, very much, very stark compared to the other ones. And I want to bring that out even more. I would add just a little, just, just a touch uh, darker and perhaps in um, a slightly more orangey pink or a slightly more purplish pink uh, to bring in some of your purples as well uh, and to bring in a little interest uh, around, I wouldn't make necessarily lines, but just a little, just little touches throughout. Um, I also I want to encourage you to start working off of your paper. Uh, when, when you work within the confines of your paper, it gets very obvious. And I have a few square looking florals um, because you can tell that, oh, I'm getting towards the edge. So I'm going to fold this leaf in this way so I have room for it. Go ahead and start painting right off of your sheet of paper uh, to, to give your flower more context and we can um, grasp where it is. Uh, and, and yeah, whether you need to tape it down or go ahead and just paint on your table, it, it'll look great once we zoom in and crop in on that painting. It won't look, um, we, we don't want to necessarily be able to know uh, what the dimensions of your paper was. Also, it makes it easier if you need to crop it in closer. It won't look uh, awkward at all because it's, you know, this is a snippet of a piece that is going on and on is the sense you want to give. Um, so with this leaf up here in the upper right that curls in and curves in so that we have space to see the whole thing, I would add more that go off the page. Uh, and that way when you're selling reproductions on Etsy or you're licensing this and it needs to be a certain proportion or dimension, wherever it's cropped, it will still do well. All right, I'm going to, whew, I gotta stop myself. Uh, stop critiquing for a second here. Um, and I'm flattered that you guys uh, wanna hear what I think at all. Uh, but one of the questions here also was um, what classes I offer on Skillshare, and then these are the these are the classes that I'm doing there. And uh, my latest, I think, yeah, my latest would be the calendar one. This was my first one, Design a Watercolorful Alphabet, and it's a little more design heavy. And Make It Fun, Make It Sell was more of an illustration bent. And Watercolor Florals is the one that I will be launching, Lord willing, on Monday. Um, and I will teach you these three different styles, uh, what I'm calling kind of a dropped watercolor uh, silhouette style, uh, what I'm calling tight vintage florals, and modern, um, modern just kind of an illustrative style uh, floral here. So... That's all I have for now. I just have the trailer and I'm not going to play it. I wanted to sign off after doing that review. Uh, you may hear my kids in the background. This is my life. And uh, I, I just wanted to uh, say thanks again. Um, and conquer, let me, I wanted, to t I wanted to tackle, not conquer, tackle a couple of last minute questions just about subject matter and knowing what to paint when you sit down. I think you uh, lead off with your strengths. I always start with uh, just listening to some music and starting to just do things that don't make a whole lot of sense like this. And then, um, and then I look at the seasons and usually if I'm thinking about art licensing and what needs to be in my portfolio, I think six months from now, what holiday is it? And I'll start working that way. So in the summer, I'm always working on Christmas. And in at Christmas, uh, I'm usually still working on Christmas. But I'm also thinking about Valentine's and Mother's Day. Uh, with being on a greeting card bent. 
Anyway, that was one last question. And the other question that I always get is what paints I use. And I use Mission, which we talked a lot about before uh, this week in the Facebook group. So uh, you guys are probably very familiar with uh, Mission and um, those paints. I have a set of, I don't know, maybe 56 or 64 uh, of those. And I just love that I, I sit them there and when I come to the table, they are ready to go. And I have a variety of colors and I love that. Anyway, best to you guys. Uh, feel free to send me an email. And um, again, I am, I'm glad to be a part of this group. And I hope that anything I said was at all helpful, then wonderful. If you want book recommendations or um, want to delve in deeper into uh, time management or licensing or whatever, perfecting your portfolio, um, feel free to ask and um, we'll chat. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>